You've all heard about it. Um, it's an amazing cutting edge technology, but the term describes a, a very broad range of applications that modify DNA to, to help cure diseases. Uh, today we're going to take a deep dive into gene therapy, what it is, um, and how it applies to the LGMDs. So we're going to do that through three talks. Um, the first will be Matt Wickland, who will be describing how gene therapy applies to the LGMD community. Uh, the second talk will then be by PJ Brooks from the NIH, who will talk about the bespoke gene therapy program there and how that's uh, harnessing the power of gene therapy and trying to make it more applicable to many rare diseases. And uh, finally, we'll have a video presentation by Sharon Hesterly, who sends her regrets. Um, she planned on being here, but her flights uh, worked against her and she was unable to make it in time. Uh, but she has uh, submitted a video on her presentation, which is essentially looking at new technologies that are coming forth that uh, will give us uh, Gene Therapy 2.0 um, and has some exciting implications. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Matt Wickland. Well, it's very nice to be here. My job is to sort of lay the groundwork for the talks that follow mine and then the talks this afternoon uh, by industry. So these are our topics. So this is genetics. What is gene therapy and how can they do that? And it's just a gene, so why is it so hard to do this? Okay, so we'll try to cover those. So let's start with genetics 101. And this is just a little background. So DNA really is the music, the script of life. And so as we look at this, this is just very simplistic. DNA is transcribed into RNA, which then goes on to become translated into protein. And so on the left, you'll see DNA is made up of nucleotides. And on the right, you'll see that proteins are made up of amino acids. So you have an LGMD gene, and that goes on to become an LGMD protein. Looking at it also on a basic level, if you look, you can see a cell, which in our case is actually a muscle fiber, and in that you have a nucleus. In the nucleus you have chromosomes. So it's important to remember that you have two copies of every gene. So there are 22 paired chromosomes. And then women have two X chromosomes. And males have two, uh, an X and a Y chromosome. And so it's always important to remember that. So you've got a nucleus in which reside the chromosomes. Chromosomes are made up of genes, which you can see down there. And the genes are made up of DNA. And then DNA is made up of nucleotides which you can see here, and they're always paired with one another. And so an A goes with a T, so adenine with thymine, and then guanine with cytosine. And then what does a gene look like? This is not what it really looks like, but this is a construct of what it would look like, in that on the left-hand side you see that there's a promoter, and that allows it to be activated in the tissue that you want it activated in. Then there are exons. Exons are portions of the DNA that go on to make the protein. And the number of exons is as little as one and as many as more than 370 in genes such as Titan, which is an LGMD gene. But interspersed between each exon, there is an intron. And introns are portions of DNA that are cut out or spliced out and then when you go from DNA to RNA, you splice out the introns, and then you have a smaller construct. And that looks like this. You splice out, and you see that there are those four exons remaining there. And then you take from the RNA, you move on to protein synthesis in the ribosome, and then you get protein. So what are the different things you can do to DNA to cause a mutation or pathogenic variant. And the way I think about it is it's pretty straightforward and simple, which it's not, uh, but two basic categories. You can have a missense mutation, and that simply means that you replace one nucleotide with another, and then that just changes the way that the nucleotides read. 
Or you can have a different change where you have either a duplication, a deletion, an inversion, or some other change to the DNA. Also basic, you've heard about this all through this, which is patterns of inheritance. So there's dominant inheritance, and what that means is that if you have one abnormal copy of your gene, that you will have disease. And in recessive, you have two mutations or pathogenic variants, one in each copy of your gene, and that leads to disease. But if you only have one abnormal copy, that means that you are a carrier. And in most cases, that means that that person would not be affected. So how does that uh, pertain? Well, if you have an autosomal dominant condition and then your partner has, does not have that condition, that means that half of the children would wind up having that autosomal dominant condition. If both parents are carriers of a disorder that's an autosomal recessive disorder, then the, the risk of children having disease would be 25% they would get neither copy that was the pathogenic variant, so they would be unaffected and not a carrier. 50% would be carriers. And then a quarter of the children would wind up having the LGMD. And then if you do have an autosomal recessive disorder and you have children, if your partner does not have a pathogenic variant in your gene, then your kids will all be carriers but should not have disease. And if your partner is a carrier, then you would have a 50% chance of one of the children having your disease. All right, so that was the background. And uh, hopefully that laid a little bit of the genetics background. Let's move on to gene therapy and also the basics of this. So this is a busy slide, but I just want to point out several aspects of this slide. Going from the left in 1866, that's when Gregor Mendel dis uh, sort of delineated the laws of heredity. 1953 is when the double helix was described by Watson and Crick. As you move across, we started to do gene therapies, but then we had this unfortunate occurrence where Jesse Gelsinger died, and for those that were around back then, that really put, initially it was called an 18-month hold, and it wound up really being about a three to five-year hold on anything moving forward in gene therapy. But then as we moved forward beyond that, in the late teens, we started to have the emergence of gene therapies. And now we have, as we heard, 15 gene therapies, and there are a number more in the pipeline. So what is gene therapy? Well, the FDA defines it as a technique that modifies a person's genes or RNA to treat, cure, or prevent a disease. Best of all worlds, it's a one-time one and done, but that may not happen as much in muscle disease. And then it often makes use of a viral vector, but it just needs a vector to get where it needs to go, and that can be other things such as nanoparticles or chaperones. Three main types of gene therapies. The first type is gene replacement, and we've heard about that. That's simply in autosomal recessive disorders. You need a working copy of that gene, and we can give that back. Gene knockdown, and that's through RNA targeting therapies, and these are good for certain disorders. Often autosomal dominant disorders can be managed in this uh, fashion. And then finally, gene editing, which is the exciting CRISPR-Cas9. You can just, you know, fix anything in the, in the DNA. There are just some challenges associated with CRISPR-Cas9 technology. So let's talk about those three types. So gene replacement, it's pretty straightforward. You have a, usually a virus, though it could be some other uh, vehicle to carry the DNA. Uh, and it simply goes in and it uh, allows a plasmid or a little circular chromosome to be created in the uh, nucleus where you can produce normal protein. The challenges are you have to have that go to the right tissues the other is, when do you dose? And the answer is, theoretically, the earlier you dose, the better. 
But if you don't have durability of effect, then you may not want to dose very early in disease, especially in the LGMDs where you have decades of progression. And then the final uh, challenge that is out there is that most of the vehicles uh, elicit an immune response, and then you have this challenge of the uh, immune system not wanting to see whatever that delivery vehicle is again, and so you have challenges with redosing. Gene knockdown, so this is, takes advantage of uh, what naturally occurs in the human body, which is that you have these small interfering RNAs, and these are microRNAs, and they tend to turn off abnormal constructs of RNA. And that's very helpful because these microRNAs seek out specific messenger RNAs, that's how they're designed, and they prevent them from being translated into protein. So this is an effect that occurs not at the DNA level, but it happens at the RNA level. And as you see on that uh, small little picture there, it's kind of like you have a magnet, and you're trying to get that needle in the haystack, and you simply have a designed construct that will only pick out the abnormal RNA constructs, and if you have normal constructs, they'll move forward. And this can be very effective in turning down the abnormal effects of autosomal dominant disorders. And then the last is gene editing, which has to do with uh, CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And again, this is maybe the best. You simply cut out what you don't want in there, or you cut out and put what you do want in there. The big challenge is that there are a lot of areas of DNA in the body. So you have six billion, six billion nucleotides. And so it often has areas that look like where you want to treat that are not where you want to treat. And so off-target effects are one of the big challenges we have with this technology. So now the challenges with gene therapy, which is sort of why aren't we here though? Let's go with the positive first. So we've had ASOs since 2016. So this is for gene, uh, for exon skipping in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We have gene transfer. And that's highly effective in nerve. And so in SMA, we now have, instead of 97% of infants dying by the age of two, we have infants that live and are almost indistinguishable from their peers. And then we have engineered gene transfer, which was just approved, which is the microdystrophin. So these are small little um, genes that are produced that are smaller than what they should be and that's because they're too big to fit in the payload capacity of our viruses. All right, we've had setbacks. I already mentioned Jesse Gelsinger. For this audience, there's a setback that really has impacted uh, the calpanopathy uh, group, and that is in 2009, there was a mouse model, and it received gene therapy, because calpane, you're just missing an enzyme. It'd be so easy, you just give it back. And, the mouse model, they did the gene therapy. It was great. The mice grew. They were just as, as fast as their peers. The only problem is that half the normal age, they died of heart failure. And that's when we learned that if you have five times as much calpane in the heart, that's bad for the heart. And that really put that whole program back because that meant we had to specifically target just skeletal muscle. Um, about three years ago, we had some deaths in uh, myotubular uh, myopathy infants, and then just uh, maybe two months ago, published in the New England Journal, there was a uh, gene editing uh, therapy that was a personalized medicine approach in a DMD gentleman, and he passed away due to liver complications. So when we decide what vector to use, what do we have to think about? First is how big is the vector? The other is what tissues does that vector target? How much of an er immune response does that vector elicit? And then how do you deliver it? So this is just very simple. Some people ask, well, why don't we just give the DNA and the RNA back? You just infuse it in the blood? And the answer is, not a bad idea, but A, it's degraded, and then B, it really can't pass through the muscle membrane, so the sar sarcolemma. And so that's why it has to be packaged in something like in this case, where you have a virus with the DNA inside. It's internalized into the cytoplasm. It then gets translocated into the nucleus. 
and then it releases its payload, which in a virus is viral DNA, but in a modified virus winds up being the LGMD gene. And so this is the way that looks in the LGMD gene, just a different cartoon. So you have a single-stranded DNA inside a virus. It attaches to a receptor. It's then translocated into the nucleus. You have uncoding. And then you have a single-stranded DNA. And then you take advantage of your body's own innate capabilities. And then your body then turns that single-stranded DNA into a double-stranded DNA that forms a loop. And so we call that a small little plasmid or mini chromosome. And the big advantage of that is that that does not incorporate into your own DNA because if it incorporates randomly in your own DNA, it may interrupt some other important function. And so it's a, a cleaner mechanism. So there are three main gene therapy viral vectors, and they're all of different sizes and different immunogenicity. And the challenge for us is that AAV is a great, minimally immunogenetic virus, but the big problem is, as you can see here, it is the smallest payload, and that limits what we can do. Some LGMD genes fit in very nicely, but others do not. So this is just a simple visualization of how you create a virus, and the answer is you simply cut out the two genes that are associated with the virus, and then you put in your LGMD gene, and that's your construct. We talked about size being a problem. Well, for genes like dysphrenopathy, that is a challenge, um, and you'll see I use simply in quotes. Um, what you can do is you can simply bifurcate the dysferlin gene, and when you bifurcate it, you put the first half in half of the viruses, you put the second half in another half of the viruses, you inject them, and any nucleus that gets both copies, it actually, these are the two constructs, they just simply combine together to form one long full dysferlin gene, and when that happens, you can see here, this is the animal model, the ones that are treated have dysferlin immunofluorescence, that's the top, and the ones that don't have treatment, they're still dysferlin deficient. We talked also about where does the virus go? Well, the virus should go to the tissue you want, and different AAV viruses have different levels of tropism, which tissue they prefer. And so the, the viruses that are generally used now include AAV RH74, which is relatively skeletal muscle specific, and then myo-AAV, which is a new sort of designed uh, viral capsid, which goes to skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. So myo-AAV, um, this was talked about in one previous presentation, but essentially this was not a designed, but it was a selected. So there were roughly three million different constructs that were tried to see whether or not which one had greatest tropism towards the uh, tissues that we wanted. And if you look on the far right column, the top four where you see that green immunofluorescence, that is the fact that you have involvement effectively transduced um, uh, uh, tissue. And the tissues include quadriceps and tibialis anterior skeletal muscles, diaphragm, which is respiratory muscle, which is also a skeletal muscle, and then heart. And if you look at the bottom right corner, that's the liver, and there's very little involvement of the liver. So this is what we've been looking for. All right, I have one last slide after this, and this is sort of the future. So in 2013, I had a gentleman who had a sarcoglycanopathy who was 53, and he wheeled in to see me in his wheelchair and he couldn't move his legs, he had no movement at his shoulders, and he was very deft at managing his driving his wheelchair. And he goes, Doc, they come back from the war, their arms are blown off, they get artificial arms, and they work great. You can cut my arms off. <laughs> I said, no, I can't do that. <laughs> but it got me to thinking, who grows arms? And the answer is, salamanders, 
And in 2013, I looked and said, how do salamanders regrow arms? And the answer is, we didn't know. And I didn't discover this, but in 2016, in the journal Nature, is when they did publish that they then finally understood the mechanism for limb regrowth in salamanders. And so this is not 2027 technology, but there's no reason this can't be 2050, 2060 technology. So I'm going to leave with that as sort of the future of the future. I do want to thank these two people. They were instrumental in helping me with uh, slides. Some of these slides are theirs, and they're wonderful. And so thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wickland. Um, our next talk will be by Dr. P.J. Brooks, and I think he has a, a very exciting initiative at the NIH, which is really designed to take advantage of some of the modular nature of gene therapy to help expand its application to a broad range of disease, which I think is, is really, or really resonates with this population, where we have a, a group of people who are identify as a very rare disease, and so we're all waiting to see when these uh, technologies might be applicable to us. So, PJ. Thanks, everybody. I uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. I'll be telling you about the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium um, and also some related projects and efforts we have ongoing at NIH. Uh, no conflicts of interest, because I, I do work for the NIH. So I'm, I work for the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS, and we're one of the newest NIH institutes and centers. And we don't focus on specific diseases or organ systems. We focus on the whole process of translation and getting things from the laboratory into the clinic and how to make that whole process easier and faster. And so our mission is to turn research observations into health solutions through translational science, which is really the scientific study of the process of translation. Um, and we have a variety of projects ongoing at NIH, and particularly at, at NCATS, where I work in the Division of Rare Disease Research Innovation. And I did want to mention this particular one. It's called the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network, or the RDCRN. And this is basically a collection of, of consortia, and each of these consortia uh, involve working on at least three related diseases. And so it's kind of like a consortium of consortia. Uh, and they're funded by many different parts of the NIH very collaboratively. Uh, and these, these projects support things like natural history studies and other kinds of research to get ready for clinical trials and to support clinical trials. Um, we've been doing this now in different iterations. We're just finishing the fourth iteration, but we're about to go to the fifth iteration. And so we have this notice that explains that we're plan to publish, and I emphasize this because it strikes me that limb girdle muscular dystrophies are the kind of a, it's an obvious grouping of diseases, um, and it might be a good opportunity for uh, the different groups in this consortium, in this group here, the different LGMDs, to um, consider applying for one of these. And so there's the information, and you'll have my email. So if anybody wants to get more information about this, I'll be happy to put you in touch with the relevant people. But really focusing on gene therapy, uh, Matt did a really nice job of kind of laying out some of the basics. But essentially what you do here is to take viral vectors, you remove their own endogenous genes, and you put in therapeutic genes. And again, in principle, <laughs> It's, it's a relatively easy way to make treatments for diseases. And you can think of, of AAV as kind of like a, a delivery box for therapeutic genes. And different AAV serotypes are almost pre-addressed, if you will, to go to certain cells and tissues. Um, and what we've been thinking is, given that there's sort of this modular aspect of this, it, this should really have implications for the way you develop gene therapies because if you're using the same delivery box over and over again, it kind of makes sense that you wouldn't have to repeat some of the same preclinical studies, toxicology, et cetera, over and over again. So one of the things we've been doing at the NIH, we developed this program called PAVE-GT, which is an experimental pilot project 
Um, we're studying four different rare diseases uh, under study at the NIH Clinical Center. Two of these are metabolic diseases, but two of them are diseases that affect uh, the neuromuscular junction we have to deliver to muscle cells. And the idea is, at least as we originally envisioned this, we're going to use the same AV vector for all four of them and keep everything the same, the route of administration and production and purification, and just switch out the transgene. And then the idea is if we go to the FDA and propose certain efficiencies based on this, they would respond to us, and then we would take that information and make it public which would be a crazy thing to do if we were a for-profit company because we'd be giving away our intellectual property. But here we all work for the government, so that's actually the goal, to try to make gene therapy uh, more efficient for everybody. And we particularly focus on diseases like many of the LGMDs that are, that are so rare that they have no commercial interest. And so one of the things we've done in, uh, actually last year or earlier this year is to uh, apply for an orphan drug designation for one of these treatments for um, propionic acidemia, uh, which we got. And now what we've done is made our application uh, uh, available to the public along with a template that anybody can use to develop a, an orphan drug designation. You can essentially cut and paste your disease and your data in there. Um, and there's the link, and, and we, we plan to be doing more of these so people can sort of see the process and kind of demystify it. And we're moving along with the PAVE-GT program. Uh, we had a pre-IND meeting, and we'll be making these and various documents public uh, as we go along. Okay, so let me now, now move to the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium, the BGTC which is a somewhat similar idea to PAVE-GT, but, but there's some significant differences. This is a public-private partnership organized by the foundation for the NIH. And a really important point here is that the foundation for the NIH is not actually part of the NIH. It's not part of the government. It's a standalone 501c3 entity that allows people from the NIH like me to work with uh, private industry and mix money in ways that I couldn't otherwise do without going to jail, basically. Um, but the FNIH exists to allow us to collaborate, and so this is a large program that I'm, I'm proud to be the co-chair along with Tim Miller from Thermo Fisher, and very importantly, uh, Peter Marks, who you heard from, I believe, yesterday, uh, was one of the key drivers of this, and um, I think it's his interest and real drive in trying to facilitate gene therapy that's really made all this um, possible. And so these are all the uh, partners, um, many different parts of the NIH, many big pharmaceutical companies you can see there, um, not only in the U.S., including throughout the world, Genethon is in France. We have some nonprofits as well, um, Nord and uh, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine is a great partner in all this. And we're roughly putting in equal amounts of money, public and private. And um, there's a couple different parts of this. One is focused on more of basic biology. How can we understand how to, for example, make vectors better and more efficiently? And also, can we enhance therapeutic gene expression from gene therapy once it goes into patients? Uh, are there simple pills you could give to people so that when you give a dose of AV, it basically just works better, and that would allow us to perhaps reduce the dose um, and that would be a value for, for many diseases, but particularly for diseases where you're trying to target the muscles. Because in these diseases, you have to give very, very high doses, and that's where often the problems are. Um, and then the second component of this, which is the clinical component, um, it's basically to, to make it easier to go from the idea for a gene therapy to an actual clinical trial by harmonizing the process and making it, making it understandable and cons consistent. So, for example, can we identify a specific set of critical quality attributes, things you would measure in, in different AAV preparations to show that they're safe? You know, what's the minimal set of tests you have to do on a batch of AAV? You might think that something like that already exists, and I, I actually did, but it doesn't. So we're trying to identify that and ultimately put it into the public domain. Um, and similarly, can we harmonize and find the minimal set of animal toxicology studies that need to be done? Because these animal toxicology studies, particularly in non-human primates, are very, very expensive. Um, 
And it would be one thing if these, these toxicology studies completely predict what happens in human beings, but unfortunately they don't because, as was mentioned earlier, we have had AAV gene therapies go into the clinic. They passed all the animal toxicology studies and they ended up with you know, patient deaths. So something is not exactly working here. And so we're going to try to identify this minimal set of toxicology studies that are needed without compromising patient safety. We're not trying, we're not trying to cut corners and risk anybody's safety. It's asking, you know, what do we really need to do to get the information we need? And so for this, we had to basically select um, a set of test diseases, if you will, to, to work out this um, streamlined path. And after a, a, a whole process involving public applications, um, we ultimately came down to eight different um, diseases. We've got three ocular diseases there, three neurologic diseases, and two where you have to do systemic administration. And we wanted this because the amount of vector that you need is very, very different. You need the highest amounts for systemic administration, the smallest amounts, you know, obviously for ocular. And so this is kind of the idea. These are basically our test cases. And what we're doing now is moving into the process of actually trying to, to do eight AAV gene therapy clinical trials in a, in a coordinated fashion. Um, and roughly what we have is a kind of a coordinating center here that shows that if you look first inside that red box, what we'll have for each one of these different diseases, we'll have a set of uh, people running different cores, a data management core, a clinical trial core, a preclinical core, and regulatory cores. Um, and these will be consistent for all eight trials, and they may subcontract things like um, critical quality attributes, animal toxicology, et cetera, testing pre-existing antibodies. And then as we look at the different diseases, the things that would be different, and the people involved, um, that will include the sponsor, which is either the NIH or or CIRM, um, the clinical PI and their team, and patient advocates. And this, these groups will all work together and coordinate with uh, other parts of the BGTC. So I'd love to tell you about how this is working, but we're actually just in the process of starting it up, and it will undoubtedly be a learning experience um, for all of us, but hopefully at the end it'll identify ways to make the process more streamlined and more efficient for everybody. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about genome editing um, that was also mentioned. This is something, this is another program um, coming from funds from the, the NIH Common Fund from the Office of the NIH Director. These are for large programs that have interest from many different parts of the NIH. And genome editing is obviously one of those. We're specifically focused here, of course, on somatic cell genome editing. Um, we completed the first phase of this program. Uh, just recently, the first five years, that was really focused on developing new technologies and building the foundation for clinical projects, and particularly focused on um, better uh, delivery vehicles. So we also wanted to make all this information in the public domain, so we set up what we call the SCEG Toolkit, and you can see the link in the QVR code there, where you can look at basically all the data that was generated in phase one, both published and unpublished. Um, to identify which some of these technologies might be of benefit to, to different groups going forward. And we've recently now moved into phase two of the SCEG that's really moving into the clinic. Um, and what we're doing here is we have a, a series of programs either on, on getting ready for clinical trials and things like testing for off-target editing. We're trying to support these as to be at the, the highest level of, of reproducibility and, and consistency so that they ultimately may become part of the uh, regulatory process. So that's what these four proje five projects are. Um, a lot of the other ones, though, we're actually trying to move more quickly into the clinic. So here what we're doing is funding um, IND enabling studies to get all the way to the, the point of a of a submitted and approved IND uh, that will be picked up by private industry, we hope. 
And so we get five of these um, IND enabling projects affecting different diseases in the nervous system, the eye. Um, we even got one focused on prenatal editing. But something we're very interested in is, you know, gene, ther gene editing and gene therapy, but gene editing in particular is really a therapeutic platform. If you have a certain editor and a certain delivery system, and you keep that the same, the only thing that you need to change from one patient to the next or one disease to the next, actually, is to change the sequence of the guide RNA. Um, so wouldn't it make a lot more sense to develop this therapeutic platform as a therapeutic platform from the very beginning as opposed to a treatment for one disease at a time? And so we wanted to fund these projects we call platform clinical trials, where you have to, they, the investigators have to use one editor and one delivery system for more than one disease and to explore that regulatory process. And we were able to fund one of these onto rare neurologic uh, neurodevelopmental diseases as shown there. And we believe ultimately, we think about the future of this, um, it's really in developing therapeutic platforms. And finally, one of the other things that we're doing as part of SCEG phase two is to try to get better delivery vehicles for genome editors, although undoubtedly some of these would also work for gene therapy. Um, so we have a prize competition that is opened up now um, to either support non-viral technologies that can cross the blood-brain barrier and deliver gene editors throughout the nervous system, or to find ways to program and target genome editors specific cells and tissues. And, and the way this is designed, we're looking for programmable systems where you can, it's almost like, a, like you know, typing in a zip code to make the editor go to specific cells and tissues, um, but they have to do at least three. And this is a prize competition. It's not funding research. We're basically giving prize of research that's already been done. That means it's a lot easier for people to apply for it compared to standard NIH grants. And basically, anybody can apply. Um, so we're really interested in novel approaches, and there's the links. And so just to kind of wrap up, I mean, I think, I, I think of it now as sort of a square peg and a round hole problem in that the whole way that we've up to now been thinking about developing treatments for single diseases is one disease at a time. But we have these therapeutic platforms like gene therapy and gene editing, oligonucleotides, that really don't fit that. Um, they really are therapeutic platforms. And I think if we can develop them that way, we can bring genetic therapies to many, many more diseases that could benefit them, not just the most common rare diseases that, that many big companies focus on for obvious um, reasons, but the literally thousands of very, very rare diseases of no commercial interest. And I think the best way to get to those is to develop therapeutic platforms from the beginning. So um, I think I'll just stop there, and there's my email. And if people have questions, I'm happy to take them, or if you want to follow up about any of the programs, you can contact me there, and I'll be happy to connect you with the right people. Thank you very much. Thank you, PJ. Uh, we all really appreciate all the hard work you're doing. Um, it really seems to take advantage of a lot of these technologies and, and bring them to a broader population, which I think is what we're really looking for here. Um, so reducing redundancy means efficiency, and efficiency means getting cures to patients faster. I greatly appreciate that. All right, so the final talk of this session will be from Sharon Hesterly from the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Um, she will be talking about uh, Gene Therapy 2.0 and giving us uh, a peek into new technologies and uh, what we might be seeing in the future. Um. I did try. Um, so you've already heard about what gene therapy looks like for limb girdle muscular dystrophy and also what the NIH is doing with its bespoke gene therapy program. I'm going to talk to you now a little bit about what the future of gene therapy could look like. And a lot of that has to do with how we're going to solve uh, some problems that we still have in gene therapy. And this, the solutions might look like gene therapy 2.0. So just briefly, a short history of gene therapy, really just to 
lay the groundwork to say that we have actually solved a lot of problems over time and that, you know, a lot of the major work in gene therapy started back in 1990 or even earlier. That was the first recorded grant that we have at MDA on gene therapy. And that was to uh, Jeff Chamberlain at University of Washington. And um, over time, we've figured out how to package genes into, you know, viruses that have been modified. We've learned how to deliver gene therapy. Um, it used to be, uh, back when I started in the field, which was in the late 90s, um, people said there was only, there were only three problems with gene therapy, delivery, delivery, and delivery. So that was, you know, a little bit of scientists trying to be funny. But um, we've actually figured out how to deliver gene therapy vectors fairly efficiently from the first gene therapy study ever um, in a muscular dystrophy was actually for alpha sarcoglycan deficiency, limb girdle 2D. And you can see here my friend and colleague, um, Donovan Decker, who was in this newspaper article as the first person who participated in a gene therapy trial. And he's still very active in the space. Um, just to say the first trial for um, gene therapy in Duchenne took place in 2004, and that was an injection in, into a single muscle. We learned uh, how to deliver these genes systemically through the blood system, usually by just using higher doses. In this uh, dog picture here, her name was Jelly, lived to be eight, um, and she was treated with gene therapy, and she naturally, you know, had a naturally occurring dystrophin mutation. And so she lived much longer than dogs typically would. Um, and she was still expressing the gene at the time of her death many years later. We were learning how to do gene editing, just to say around 2013 is our, you know, at least the first grant that we made at MDA on gene editing. And then just to mark some drug approvals, um, for example, Spinraza and Exondus, which aren't exactly like gene replacement, but they alter the way a cell makes a um, protein product from the mutated gene. So they're sort of forerunners to gene therapy. The first true gene therapy approved was Zilgensma for SMA, which was you know, somewhat miraculous. These were uh, babies who would die by age two who were now meeting motor milestones and walking in some cases. Um, we have started to fund non-viral gene therapy and also most recently in 2023, there was the approval of Elevitus for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So you can really see how the field has come a long way. Um, this is just to show you briefly what the landscape looked like in 2017, where you have just a handful of marketed drugs that you hear, see here in the center. And going out, you see earlier and earlier stages of drug development. You compare that to 2022, you can see that um, the field has gotten very crowded, especially in this space out here which is uh, the earlier stages of development, that there's a very strong pipeline coming along for gene therapy. Um, to mention briefly that when we talk about gene therapy, just from the standpoint of semantics, mostly um, when I use the term, I'm talking about gene transfer, which is when you're putting a healthy copy of a gene into a cell that contains a, a mutation in its own copy of the gene. So you're not literally replacing the gene because the original um, mutated gene is still there. You're just adding a healthy copy of the gene. Gene editing, of course, is when you're um, changing the actual chromosomal DNA, and there are lots of ways to do that. You can cut the gene um, with these little molecular scissors, we call them, um, and make changes in a number of different ways that can be beneficial and can be heritable that you could pass on. And when cells divide, they pass on to each of the daughter cells. And then finally, gene silencing is important when we talk about uh, dominant diseases where the gene mutation doesn't just cause that protein product not to be made, that, that actually that mutation uh, creates a bad actor, either the RNA or that protein product is doing something particularly bad that you need to have uh, removed. And so you can use something called RNA interference to sort of silence that. That's important for things like um, myotonic dystrophy, or FSH dystrophy that are dominant diseases. Could be also useful technique for some of the dominant limb girdles. Um, so MDA has been holding a meeting uh, for the last two years and we're scheduled to hold it again in 2024 um, called Challenges in Gene Therapy. That's really looking at, um, you know, we made a huge amount of progress. What do we still need to solve and what are the ideas for how to do that? So I'm going to give you just a few highlights from uh, the list of that meeting. 
So one of the big issues in gene therapy is unwanted immune response. And you can have a lot of different types of immune response, immune responses to the viral capsid. You can have an immune response to the um, actual therapeutic protein if the body hasn't seen that protein before. And these immune responses come in sort of different waves from pre-existing that, you know, occurs before you, you know, the immune response you might already have to a vector before you are treated. Um, and then innate immunity and adaptive immunity, which is sort of come in different times after treatment. Um, so an example here, um, a pre-existing antibody. So if you've been exposed to adeno-associated virus, we'll say this is a virus that typically doesn't cause symptoms. So you're unlikely to know that you were ever even exposed to it. But your body could develop antibodies to it. And if you have these pre-existing antibodies, it might mean if you were treated with gene therapy that it just wouldn't work well because the you know antibodies would mark any cells that took up the virus for destruction. Or it worst case scenario, you could have a very strong immune response um, that could cause problems. And so people with pre-existing antibodies right now are excluded from um, being able to be treated with a given gene therapy vector. And that's a percent that depends on the, it could be, depend on how old you are, where you are in the country, what you've been, been exposed to, and um, what serotype of virus is being used. Um, but it ranges from, you know, maybe 10% of people might have pre-existing antibodies to 80 or 90%, depending on the situation. And then post-treatment, you know, after you've been treated with a viral vector, you've functionally been immunized against it. And so your antibody count is going to be very high. And um, post-treatment, everyone has high levels of antibodies. And what that means from a practical standpoint is that you can't be retreated um, after you have this high level of antibodies because the body would just, you know, uh, reject the treatment and it wouldn't work. So those are two big problems that we have right now. Uh, the need to be retreated is important because uh, you maybe if you had a too low of a dose um, or maybe over time uh, it stopped working as well and you need to be treated again, this would be a problem. So ways that we can deal with that, immunosuppressant drugs could potentially block um, pre-existing antibodies or maybe block new antibodies from forming as you are treated. So these are things that we're looking at, sort of heavy-duty drugs, rituximabs, uh, sirolimus, tacrolimus, um, to see if they can do that. Plasma rephoresis is a technique that actually takes the blood out of the body, removes the antibodies, and puts it back in. Um, it's used right now to treat various types of autoimmune diseases, but um, there's been some thought that maybe you could do that to remove the antibodies to a viral capsid. And... Um, you know, it really would be a matter of just understanding how often you might have to do this and what are the risks and really understanding if it would be effective. There are also uh, enzymes that can cleave certain types of circulating antibodies called IgGs. These are endopeptidases that could potentially be used to sort of knock down the antibody response. And then finally, another uh, thing that people have been trying is to alter the gene therapy vector to make it a little stealthier so the immune system doesn't see it. And you can tell that this vector over here has been altered to be very stealthy because he's now in camouflage and wearing sunglasses. So the immune system can't see him. The challenge is that these are really highly organized structures. And so when you make a change in one place, a lot of times it changes something else you didn't intend. So you might have a stealthy vector that you can no longer manufacture or a stealthy vector that's going primarily to the liver instead of to muscle. So this has been challenging, but people are trying to do it. Um, you know, one person who's been um, working on this problem is Dr. Barry Byrne at University of Florida. And recently, MDA, Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy and Curity Shin co-funded Dr. Byrne to test a new drug, uh, Vivgard, that was approved in, for myasthenia gravis. So Vivgard is able to block a certain type of antibody very effectively. And um, so Dr. Byrne is going to test that to see if it will have benefit on people who have pre-existing antibodies or even if you can knock down antibodies post-treatment, which is a higher hurdle. So that's a small study that's going to be taking place over the next year. And if effective, maybe this is a strategy that could be used in other gene therapy trials. Um, side effects that we see in gene therapy still need to be dealt with. The mild ones, nausea and vomiting, are really common um, in gene therapy, and they can be even somewhat severe. 
um, but treatable. Um, less common, but serious side effects that occur in about 8 to 10% of people um, you sort of occur in different types of uh, side effects over time. In the first two weeks, you tend to get a response to the viral capsid that can include complement activation, liver and kidney injury, this thrombotic microangiopathy, which are microscopic blood clots due to blood, red blood cell destruction. These things are addressable, and one of the keys is just very close monitoring. Um, and that was say addressable most of the time. Um, later on, you might um, see a second wave of immune response, um, this time sort of T-cell mediated against liver inflammation that can cause liver inflammation and toxicity. And you can also get skeletal and cardiac muscle inflammation due to an immune response to the actual protein, the therapeutic protein you're expressing. Um, I should say that overall in gene therapy, we know that it's not always treatable, that there have been two deaths in Duchenne, four in X-linked myotubular myopathy, and two in SMA. Um, in every case in these really tragic events, um, the field has tried to learn from them to better understand what went wrong and be able to address it more effectively in future cases. But one of the things that, you know, first line of defense is better monitoring in every case where we um, have a really unfortunate circumstance like this. It's either a serious adverse event or even one that ends in death to try to document exactly what went wrong and can we monitor this more closely to prevent it from happening in the future. So better protocols, tighter monitoring, more conservative eligibility criteria, people with underlying uh, liver or cardiac um, you know, dysfunction may not be good candidates for gene therapy, it looks like. Um, also, certain people have uh, mutations that might predict that you would get a um, more likely to have an immune response to that therapeutic protein. So, for example, in Duchenne, um, some mutations are being eliminated based on the fact that you would have potentially a, a, an immune response to the transgene. Um, another idea is to try to induce tolerance by expressing these things in the liver. This has been done in organ transplant, and they're looking to see if you could apply that same uh, strategy to, um, to gene therapy. And then finally, just lowering the dose can be very effective in preventing some of these serious adverse events. And there's a whole new crop of viral vectors that have been developed that are target um, muscle much more effectively, or at minimum, they don't go into the liver as, as effectively, which means there's more available to go into muscle. And that allows you to lower the dose, which honestly, when you look at animal data, you can see that the side effects you know, profiles get significantly better the lower the dose. So you still want the good effects, but with the lower side effect profile. Um, you know, uh, one of the ways uh, addressing these types of uh, responses that you can have to the new protein itself. So the, the body has never seen this protein. You know, if you're not making any of it due to a mut underlying mutation, when you suddenly introduce a healthy version of the protein, you might trigger an immune response. And so um, following the meeting, gene therapy meeting last year, MDA funded both Jeff Chamberlain and Carrie Michelli, uh, to look at various ways of um, addressing this problem of an immune response to transgenes. So Jeff is looking at redesigning these mini dystrophins so they're less likely to trigger an immune response. And uh, Dr. Michelli is looking at, um, within a single cell, trying to understand uh, what, what is being expressed in that cell that's related to this uh, immune response. And so then we can better try to design ways to get around it. So another challenge in gene therapy is permanence, and you've heard the expression one and done, but is it really? Um, the short answer is we don't know. Um, in the nervous system, you've kind of heard the dogma, you're born with all the nerve cells you're ever going to have. So if you put something in those nerve cells, it should stay forever. I mean, in reality, we know that's not exactly true in the nervous system. There are new cells that are born over time. Um, and muscle is also a very long-lived tissue for the most part. So we anticipate if you put these genes in, they sh should stay for a while. But you do get muscle turnover with muscle damage. Um, and when you put a therapeutic gene in, it goes in the nucleus, but it's not in the chromosomal DNA. It's sort of sitting out here to the side. So, for example, if you get these genes into stem cells and those cells then divide 
the cells will copy the chromosomal DNA, but they don't copy anything that was sitting outside the chromosome. So, you know, what would happen over time is you would sort of dilute out the benefits of this therapeutic gene. So, for example, if you could imagine treating a small child um, with gene therapy, it could be very effective. But as that child grows and adds new muscle, um, even, even if you have this um, vector in the stem cells, it won't be copied. So it'll sort of be diluted out over time. Um, ways that we could get around this theoretical problem, uh, gene editing, permanently changing the chromosomes. If you did that in stem cells, then each time those cells divide, this change would be copied as well. And so you would continue to make um, new muscle tissue that has been corrected if you can treat stem cells. Um, and then redosing, if you can just uh, get around this antibody problem and be able to redose the viral vector, then it wouldn't matter potentially um, if this isn't permanent. You could just do it as often as you needed to. But um, those are sort of one challenge and two ways of potentially getting around it. Um, you know, finally, gene therapy delivery, like how do we get, um, how do we efficiently be able to make this available to people at a local, uh, you know, care center or specialty neuromuscular center? And so that turns out to be non-trivial. We did a workshop um, last February or earlier this year in February to ask um, care center directors, you know, where they see the biggest challenges. And they saw lots of challenges and they were sort of bend them into these four groups of, you know, how do we do this safely? How do we have the adequate level of resources we need to support this? Um, how do we learn how to do it if we've never done it before? And that just, you know, what's available in my region potentially to help support gene therapy? And the bottom line is they're more or less drowning in paperwork. Um, you know, out of the 180 care centers that MDA supports, about 70 have experience uh, delivering gene therapy for SMA with Zolgensma, even if that's just one or two patients. And then, you know, the rest presumably don't know how to deliver gene therapy or haven't done it before and need to learn how to do it. And it's a fairly complicated process. They're also all short staff. This happened during COVID and it hasn't really been corrected yet. Um, and so between the high paperwork requirements and the staffing needs and the training needs, it's quite a lot. So just having a drug developed is the first step. If it's not accessible, then we, you know, I think that um, we still haven't accomplished our mission. So uh, MDA, and I'm not going to go into this in detail though, but based on what we've learned so far and uh, working with our care center staff, are developing a training resource that will be a platform that's available to all the care center sites that has training documents, um, you know, uh, best best practices documents, standard operating procedures, lots of information on how to do this. Also, some training um, and uh, educational materials that that sites can hand out to their patients. Uh, referral networks and finally at, you know on staff at MDA we have specific uh, people who are trained to support uh, people in gene therapy so these are sort of uh, patient facing people who have particular expertise in gene therapy so if you call the resource center you can talk to these people and they can answer your questions about gene therapy um, so that's one of the ways that we're working to address this um, Talking about gene therapy 2.0, the other thing that I see coming is non-viral gene therapy. So these viruses can be pretty complex, um, lots of immune issues to get around. They're also expensive to make. It's hard to make lots of them. Um, and so people have been looking at ways that you can deliver uh, genes without using viruses. Um, artificial polymers, you can actually just conjugate them to antibodies and direct them to muscle. You can put them in these lipid nanoparticles, which are kind of like little blobs of fat. Um, again, using antibodies, you can sort of zip code these things to different places. And even electricity, you can uh, electroporate uh, new DNA into cells with a little zap of electricity. And there are more things in development. So I think we're going to see a lot of creative solutions to doing gene therapy without using viral vectors, but it's early days. Um, finally, just a quick word, I think what we're going to see more and more are these um, N equals 1 studies or smaller studies for ultra-rare diseases, particularly relevant for limb girdle muscular dystrophy because we know that's not one monolithic disease. It's actually 
over 30 different diseases when you look at genes with more being found. So MDA is tackling this internally. We have a program called Kickstart um, that's focused on ultra rare disorders and gene therapy and really focused at the very beginning of this drug development process where people are trying to get feedback from the FDA about um, how to do a good investigational new drug um, application. And so we've started with a congenital myasthenic syndrome, but might be able to add additional indications as time goes on. And again, this is sort of an in-house drug development program that's been a very interesting um, learning experience for all concerned. Um, so in conclusion, I'd just like to say, what will Gene Therapy 2.0 bring? New vectors that are more efficient, they're stealthier, and they can get into muscle at lower doses. Uh, ways to redose after treating, that's going to be particularly important, um, if, um, especially if you want to treat small children, for example, who might be adding a lot of muscle mass as they grow. Um, we're learning how to do gene editing to make permanent changes, inheritable changes. Again, early days, but that uh, area is progressing rapidly. Using things to deliver genes that aren't viruses, non-viral gene therapy, could have a lot of advantages, maybe potentially cheaper and easier to produce, potentially could carry larger genes, and uh, possibly not as immunogenic. Um, again, early days. Ultra rare and individual gene therapies, I think we're gonna have to figure out how to do that because the majority of neuromuscular diseases are actually ultra rare. And these are, you know, the smaller your population, the less of a commercial model that can be made. So we've got to figure out how to do this. And then finally, the care centers are evolving to figure out how to deliver gene therapies efficiently. So that's what we're going to see in the future. That's Gene Therapy 2.0. And thank you so much for letting me talk. And again, sorry I can't be here in person, but I hope this was helpful. Thanks a lot.